Boston Herald Radio. This audio podcast brought to you by Beacon Hill Wine and Spirits and Beacon Hill Wine and Gourmet. Go to BeaconHillWine.com. He's the author of the book, Unusual for Their Time, on the road with America's First Ladies. Andrew, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am good, Andrew, but I don't know what to make of what I saw last night. I thought that Melania Trump did a wonderful job. I, I thought she seemed, uh, a low, like, as Hillary Chabot was saying, a little nervous. She seemed uh, authentic and, um, and that it was a kind of a heartwarming delivery. Well, you, you have that part right, and, and I agree. She, she looked great, as we know that she always does. She sounded uh, nervous, but, but um, sort of endearingly so. Uh, she has not been out in front of the cameras very much in this political cycle. She's done some stuff here and there, but we really don't know much beyond her modeling career and her very notorious and famous husband. So the problem here is that whether you agree with these similarities or the plagiarism charges or not, it's it's a thorn in their side. What they needed out of this was what I've been saying for for months and, and what Trump has has agreed with me on, I don't know if he agrees with me specifically, but agree is that Melania Trump could be the next Jacqueline Kennedy. And the aftermath and the, and the, the fallout from, from the similarities to her and Michelle Obama's speeches takes the wind out of those sails, and that's just not what they needed. So, Andrew, what can she do now? What, what do they do now? Because I think people do, regardless, regardless of what the, what the copy was that she lifted or that, that she said that somebody else lifted, I don't see a lot of people blaming her, seeing anything pernicious or, or malicious about her. So does, what does she do? Can she get back out there and say something? She can get back out there and say something. Uh, what they do is they figure out who's responsible, they fire that person, and they chalk it up as someone that was paid too much to miss a mistake like this. Then Melania gets out there full time, full blast, like she should have been doing after a you know, uh, a hugely successful evening. I, I really, I really had high hopes, and and I've been saying for for weeks now uh, about that the that the RNC could be or should be the Melania show. Yes. Donald Trump is known. We 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 know him. We know what we get. What we don't know is Melania. But what many people don't know is that she's highly intelligent, a successful businesswoman, young, beautiful. We can see that obviously, but she speaks five different languages. You can't be a ding dong and speak five different languages. So clearly, the woman has a head on her shoulders. And now they push her out there. They highlight the work that she's done with breast cancer awareness, with the Red Cross, and other things that is very, very first lady like. And they turn her back into the young, beautiful first lady that the country has fallen in love with historically since um, Julia Tyler, the, the 10th presidency of the United States, had a young 23-year-old former model from New York um, who caught the country by storm. And, and then, again, Frances Cleveland in the late 1800s, the youngest first lady at 21 years old. Uh, the country fell in oh love goodness. with her. She was on the cover of every magazine and, and, and newspaper article. And, and young Edith Roosevelt, Theodore's wife, with her, uh, with her uh, six or five... Six, if you count Theodore, is one of the children, which which I which I do because he was uh, he was a rascal. We know that. But <laughs> my point yeah. being that, that that these these women take the country by storm because they are celebrities. The younger they are, the more beautiful they are, and the more engaged with the public and charitable uh, causes they are, they they far surpass their husbands in popularity. And Melania can do wonders for Donald Trump. Andy Oak, uh, it's Hillary Chabot jumping in here, and I know that uh, you are all about the first ladies, but, you know, Donald Trump's campaign has been about first to some extent in upsetting the apple cart. This has just been a cycle unlike any other. Don't you th- feel as though this could be an opportunity for Ivanka, for the for the uh, daughter of Donald Trump, the daughter of a presidential nominee, to really um, reshape the role of presidential children and uh, become an exceptionally prominent uh, uh, surrogate for her father. One thousand percent, Hillary. You are dead on. And what we're seeing in this election cycle, beyond the stuff that we've never seen before, like the potential for a female uh, president um, and the potential for a first first gentleman, in two cases, had Carly Fiorina done uh, better than, than she did. Um, but we have not seen um, we have not seen presidential children step into the limelight since again the late 1800s when when Grover Cleveland 
um, at least in, 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 in large proportions. When, when Grover Cleveland moved into the White House as president in 1880-something, uh, that, that date escapes me right now, forgive me, but when he stepped in, he was a bachelor, the second only bachelor president. His sister, Rose, uh, took the first lady hostessing duties. And historically speaking, in the 1700s, 1800s, none in the 1900s that I can think of, daughters, nieces, sisters took first lady hostessing duties all the time. Now that we are more accepting of, of women's roles in politics and policy, um, uh, Ivanka could, could come in and, and be a great surrogate. And, and, and if, if we flip the coin, if Hillary Clinton wins, we are not going to see first gentleman Bill Clinton and Madam President Hillary Clinton in the same room very much, similarly to when, they were, when she was a senator. He would take a majority of the thunder. He is no shrinking violet. And in that scenario, we see Chelsea Clinton taking, standing in and taking almost every, at least the, the more feminine roles of a first lady. So it, 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 is, it is beyond an unusual election cycle. What if, Andy, you just mentioned that they have to fire whoever wrote the speech. What if Ivanka wrote the speech? What if it's somebody unfireable? Then, then what do you do with Melania? Well, then, then they lie. <laughs> they, they <laughs> then they, they fire somebody anyway. I'm not even beginning on kidding. Uh, here's, here's where Melania went, went wrong, and I know what she was trying to do. She said she wrote the majority of the speech herself. Now, anyone who thinks that any of these folks, any of these politicians, any of these politicians, wives, children, write speeches all on their own and just step out onto a podium, onto a stage, behind a podium, and say what is exactly on their mind, what exactly they wrote, is fooling themselves. They're joking. They're living in a fantasy world. These people pay top dollar for professionals to vet and write and counsel and edit and re-edit until the speech is absolutely perfect. I know for a fact that George H. W. Bush, or I'm sorry, George W. Bush, used to go back and really give it a once over and put his own personal touch on it. We all know that uh, Bill Clinton rarely used a teleprompter and went off script uh, uh, often. But but the base core speech and points, bullet points, are written by professionals. I've known a number of professional speechwriters in Washington D.C. that have written from for presidents anywhere from Johnson on up through through Obama, and someone screwed up. Now, whether if, if that's that someone that, that let Melania have the final go and, and didn't yeah. give it a once, once over or, or whoever, they'll find someone, and that someone will be paid handsomely if, it's, if they're taking the fall to step aside quietly, or if it's the actual person that, that, did, that, that did commit the, uh, the, 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 um, that, that, did, that did mess up. Then, then that person will get rightfully fired. But, but some, someone, will be, someone will be fired and their last name won't be Trump. <laughs> do, you think, uh, do you think that, the, that they should be, and I know you've, you've kind of mentioned this, but I don't think we saw, I don't think there should ever be a time on that stage where Ivanka is not there. <laughs> is there, can she be MC? What yes. excuse can we have? I mean, uh, Andrew, should he ever be up there without a woman there? You're, you're, you're right, and, and, and here, let's, here's, a, here's the thing that right off the bat I thought, okay, here we go, this is it, this is going to be the moment, this is going to be the show. Trump, wa- Donald Trump walked out and introduced his own wife. Unprecedented. This is a brilliant, look, the man knows TV, the man knows marketing, the man knows strategy. And that's why I think right now, I mean, that guy's got to be punching holes in walls to be hearing this news. He's got to be as upset right now as Cruz was the morning he woke up and Trump said, hey, I don't know if he was born in America. I mean, this is just exactly what they don't want. They wanted every headline, every magazine cover to be every beautiful Trump daughter, wife, everything to be like, these are the women that are going to take this man into the next uh, presidency, into the next you know, decade, into the ne- you know, wherever you want to go with that. And it just, it just didn't happen for them again, agree or disagree. It's hard to deny when you look at the, at the people who are posting this stuff all over the place. You know, you go back and forth, and here's what Michelle said, here's what uh, Melania said. Whether it's intentional, whether it was supposed to be an influence, or whether she got the wrong, you know, someone might have loaded the wrong speech into the teleprompter. Right. I don't know. I, I I'd go with there. that. Fire but, the teleprompter I mean, guy. Hey, you know, it's, it's all, it's all, it's, if, 
if other politicians, and I won't mention any by name, can stand up and say, I did not do this with that person, or this didn't happen, or I didn't know, then why can't Melania come up and say, like, eh, you know what, got the wrong speech. We were using it as a model, and, and, and that, was the, that was, you know, what we didn't want to say. But the wrong copy got in, or someone got confused, yes. or whatever. That's where I say what she does is they just say, look, it was a mistake, could have gone a little better. We still think the intent was there. Melania is very sincere. Boom, you put her out on the trail. You get her by herself. You get her out there in groups, going to town hall meetings, flipping yep. pancakes, going to libraries, reading to kids, and you see this young, beautiful, engaged, smart woman that can speak for herself. And then, you got, then, then, you, then you're right back where you want to be. We're talking to Andrew Oak, uh, author, first first ladies man, uh, unusual for their time on the road with America's first ladies. Andrew, has there been a first lady or a prospective first lady who has um, who has recovered from a uh, a, a negative uh, reputation? Of course, of course. I mean, from the history of time, there has been. You know, we always say that this is the worst campaign, or you know, oh my gosh, you've never seen anything like this. The Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams uh, campaign of the early 1800s. If Johnson were alive, I mean, if, if Jackson were alive today, he'd tell you the campaign killed his wife. She had a stroke and a heart attack a month before he was inaugurated, or a month wow. before he was supposed to go to, because the, the John Quincy Adams uh, uh, campaign just dragged her through the mud in the paper. They called her a bigamist. They called her a horseback Oh, my God, pipe, really? Hill, hillbilly. Well, I... To the JQA team's credit, you could argue that some of that was true. She, oh. she was married before, but it was yeah. in the it was in the backwoods of Tennessee in in the in the late 1700s, early 1800s, where divorces in courts and things. She was married to a, a physically and and verbally abusive alcoholic husband. She left him, filed for the divorce, and it's just a matter of when the papers went through or if they went through at all. And women in the hills of, of, of Tennessee did smoke pipes back then. But, you know, people, women smoke cigars now. It's not, you know. So whether, whether how much or, or which, you know, you can spin any, anything any different way. And she was older and she wasn't particularly attractive. Um, there's other women that have overcome, uh, like Ida McKinley comes to mind. She was severely ill. She had epileptic seizures and things like that. What McKinley's people did was they got out, out ahead of all of it and did a biography on her. It had never been done for any first lady before. And they published an actual pamphlet, a handout pamphlet, put her all over every campaign button and, and, and plate and, and, and souvenir spoon. I've seen all this stuff in my travels. Um, and, Ooh, a and souvenir they, spoon? I want a oh, souvenir yeah, yeah. spoon, like, Shattuck. Like, Agreed. Like you see in truck stops and stuff along like the Jersey Turnpike, you get like thimbles and spoons. And stuff. They had Ida McKinley spoons back then. Wow. All right, Andrew Oak, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, your book again, unusual for their time. Uh, really appreciate, of course, on the road with America's first ladies. Um, thanks so much for joining us and talking about the big uh, story of the morning, of course, which is uh, Melania's speech and, and, of course, other first ladies. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. Boston Herald Radio. This audio podcast brought to you by Beacon Hill Wine and Spirits and Beacon Hill Wine and Gourmet. Go to beaconhillwine.com.